West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Hi, I'm Sarah Connor, and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. On tonight's show, we are continuing our two-part series on dog ownership and training. Um, my guest is Lori Foss with her two dogs, Juanita and Merritt, um, and she is with dog training... Um, Dog training and Dog consulting training service. Dog training and <laughs> consulting service. I'm sorry, Lori. Um, and tonight's show, we're going to talk about bringing a new dog into your family and that process. And we're going to use my experience over the past year. Um, we rescued a dog uh, a year ago, June. And we're going to use that kind of as an example of some of the do's and don'ts of new dog ownership. <laughs> and Lori has been helping me with our, our little rescue dog, Merlin. So let me just give a little brief synopsis of how Merlin came okay. to be, and then we can uh, analyze all the things that we <laughs> could have done differently and the things that we did right. So we decided we wanted a dog, and the whole family agreed, and we knew we'd been told, you know, it is a lot of work, it's a commitment, and, and we were all on board with that, and I felt strongly I wanted to rescue a dog. So I did a lot of research on breeds. I talked to a lot of rescue organizations about specific dogs. Um, the people I talked to, I let them know that we had young children. We'd never owned a dog before. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, and then we saw Merlin. It seemed like a good fit. Um, and he, turns out, was in Arkansas. So we had never even met him. So you really, when you said you saw him. We saw him on the internet, saw, on Pet okay. Finder. We did a Pet Finder oh. rescue. And so see, that's he, why those dating services aren't right good either. Right, <laughs> That's right, you see the picture and then you meet the person. It's like, oh, hmm. So, uh, so Merlin came up on one of these trucks that brings all the rescue dogs up and, um, and he joined our family. And um, now having had a year with him, and we love Merlin, but he has, He's a high maintenance dog. We'll put it that way. Um, what do you, what would you normally tell people if I had come to you prior to doing all of this? What would well, your advice have been? I think to that, me or um, to someone considering adopting a dog. Usually, I would ask them. For instance, if you had said that you had him in mind already, mm -hmm. I would want to know what did you actually know about him. Mm -hmm. And the answer would probably be not very much. And I think you told me, if memory mm -hmm. serves, that the person that uh, was foster caring was giving you some information. Yes. Um, but what I like to do when I get information about a dog, whether I'm talking to a potential client or trying to screen a dog, is I don't ask people for the conclusions. In other words, my dog is good with kids, or my dog has separation anxiety, or my dog is dominant aggressive. Right. I want specifics of behavior without the interpretation. Okay. Because yeah. when people give you the interpretation, it's often wrong and leads you down all sorts of meandering paths that have nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. So we might have gone with, you know, let's find out exactly what are his living circumstances now. Mm -hmm. uh, very often when people do rescue, they have a lot of dogs. He mm -hmm. may have spent a majority of time in the crate. He may have gone from the crate to outside and back in his crate and spent some time, you know, in an outdoor kennel run. Or we don't know how much actual interaction he really had. Mm -hmm. So the fact may be that she really didn't know that much about him. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, depending on how meticulous you want it to be, you might want to say, well, do you have the option of when you actually meet him of saying, well, gee, mm, I, don't, I don't know if that's really the dog for us. And that's really hard because if yes. you've been looking at a dog and you see its picture and you've built up this whole big, and mm -hmm. you've got the collar and you've got the bed and you've got the name <laughs> and then you see him, you almost have to be cold-hearted at that point to say, well, no, I don't want that dog. Right. And most of the, my discussions with rescue organizations is they do have kind of an out clause where if it really isn't a good fit, if mm -hmm. something happens, they want to make sure you're actually going to give the dog back to them versus I don't even want to think about what else you would do with the dog. But Well, I think it's really um, important for people to understand that the variation 
in dogs' personalities and ease of managing and ease of training is huge. Mm -hmm. And I think most people think that if they get a dog and they're nice and they love it and they give it proper care and bring it to some classes that, you know, that's all that matters and they can be the, the primary force in, in molding and shaping the dog. And the primary force is what you have already. And so what you actually have is a lot more important than what you're putting into it. And I certainly wouldn't want to... So you're saying what you have to work with. Yeah. The basic nature oh, yeah. of that particular yeah. dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you, can, if you can get the right dog for your situation, it's really going to minimize how much effort and work mm -hmm. you have to put into the situation. And honestly, you know, I have to give you a lot of credit because... <laughs> Everyone a lot. I mean, well, yeah, because you've put... I mean, before I met you, I think you told me you'd done eight months of previous training. Right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, about. all right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it yeah. wasn't quite getting where we want to yeah. go. Then you worked with me privately a few mm -hmm. times. You're coming to my group classes. How many people are going to do that? Yeah. You know, they're going to hit a wall where the dog is acting up to a certain point and say, you know, I did this and that's it. And, yeah. Uh, that's well, there is for a me. Time, there's a time commitment. And if you don't have the time, then you're, you're just, it's not going to happen. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. time commitment, but it's, it's almost like a, an emotional commitment because it can be very frustrating, as you know. Yeah. Um, I think there were times when you, you just felt scared and like mm -hmm. you didn't know what to do and it was emotionally yeah. draining and, um, yeah. you know, those are all real issues. Right. <laughs> Aside from the fact that you have to learn a lot of physical techniques and coordination and awareness that is awkward and, and new and mm -hmm. a struggle to really absorb and make part of you. Right. Well, and I think, so, um, just to give a synopsis of what, Merlin is not, he's not an evil dog, but he's, <laughs> he, he's high energy. Um, he is pushy, mm -hmm. and several people have told me that. So if he wants something, you know, we have to be very firm with him that, you know, what we say goes. Well, kind people of like have a pushy a, kid. Well, people <laughs> think that dogs just want to please us. Yeah. And that's not true at all. Yeah. Dogs want us to love them, mm -hmm. um, but very often they want to do what they want to do, and they couldn't care less what you want right. them to do. And one of the things that makes a dog easy to manage is there are dogs who really do want to do what you want them to do. Yeah. And those people don't call me, so I don't meet right. very you many meet of many those either. dogs. <laughs> but, right. And they wonder why I even have a business right. at all. But the vast majority of dogs, at least in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. are going to say, you know what, I love you, but I'm going to chase that squirrel. Right. Or, and then you need to learn how to manage to that's train. Right. And a lot of it for us was, so we, we brought Merlin home, and it was like just even even if he had been the sweetest most easy dog in the world it's a whole new language you have to learn it's a whole i mean we didn't know anything about owning a dog and then you add kind of a tough dog on top of it mm -hmm. is just i mean we were all overwhelmed i mean my girls pictured walking him which won't happen anytime soon. My husband, I think, thought he was going to come trained. I really think he thought. I think a lot of people. The dog was going to come <laughs> off the truck and sit and lie down and say, oh, "Okay, I'll you know I'll go to sleep now." And and so we we just didn't know what to expect. So what do you tell your clients? I mean, regardless of easy or difficult dogs, what do you expect when you bring a new dog? Well, again, assuming you know, it hasn't I, had any training. A lot of the people that uh, we had watched earlier mm -hmm. in the video clips, yes. um, with the exception of Donna. Mm -hmm have had dogs and many years of many generations of having dogs um, and again I kind of what I tell people I base on what people already know so mm -hmm. I think what I would do is I would ask what your expectations were and see if it sounded like you were being realistic yeah and if it didn't sound like you were being realistic I'd mm -hmm. fill in the blanks for you right so um, you know okay it takes time well how much time and right. you know are what is your schedule what is your plan to take the dog out? What is your plan to exercise the dog? Mm -hmm. um, do you have time to take training? Are yeah. you going to enclose your yard in some kind of safe way? And if not, then what are you going to do about that? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things, you know. Right. So there's a lot to know. And as yeah. I say, different dogs have different needs. Um, and some dogs are just going to be tougher than others. And I think to some degree, I mean, we talked before about how a little dog is not necessarily easier, um, but in a lot of ways, just because they are small, mm -hmm. they are going to be easier. Right. And a dog Merlin size, you know, he's big enough and he's active. He has a high energy requirement. He needs mm -hmm. exercise. If he doesn't yeah. get exercise and he doesn't get trained, he would not be livable. Right. Now you have a dog like Bergdorf, um, you know, the bulldog, most bulldogs, and I say most because I have certainly worked with some that are way outside of this box, <laughs> um, but most of them are very happy to sit around on the couch. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, that was one of the reasons why Donna selected Bergdorf as a dog, was because she knew bulldogs would be content to sit around. And right. she didn't want to have to do the, all the training and the exercising yeah. and all those sorts of things. And so, you know, Merritt, who's totally snoozed out right now, <laughs> you'd never know it, he's actually a high energy dog. Yeah. He needs to run every right. day. And if he doesn't run every day, Oh, he'll pace around and whine and look Some, pathetic yeah, get and get all twitchy. Or, and, yeah. Well, at his age, I don't know how much mischief he'd get into, but he'd certainly be annoying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, which, yeah. I mean, and with which Marla again, you wouldn't do. know looking at him right. <laughs> on the floor here, but that's definitely what he's all right. about. If Juanita wanted exercise, she could do laps around my couch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that's, so that's something else to consider yeah. is how much I mean, exercise it, you're able to give the how dog. Much exercise, how much exercise, what is their energy the level has. is, mm -hmm. um, how pushy they are. I mean, if I had met Merlin, when he got off the truck. <laughs> Sounds kind of funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there is a picture where I, where that is of us getting him yeah, off there the truck. <laughs> are pro there are probably things that I could have told you yeah. and probably a lot of things I couldn't have told you. Yeah. Because when a dog comes out of a particular situation that's kind of overwhelming to them, uh -huh. you don't really see their true colors. Right. Yeah, and he was when, exhausted. I mean, yeah. he slept probably the first yeah, week. Yeah, so if you met him, you know, I probably exhausted. would have noticed that he, I think I would have caught that he was tired, yeah. and I probably would have said I couldn't tell you that much about him, so right. you're kind of taking a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the advantages of going to a good breeder, and when I say good breeder, there are a lot of people who breed dogs. Uh, you get them off the internet, off mm -hmm. classified ads, but a good breeder knows their dog generationally. Uh, they can tell you what your puppy's going to be like. You can meet related dogs who are adults to get a really good idea. And that's one of the tremendous advantages of getting a purebred dog. So I know everybody, you know, wants to do the right thing and adopt a, a rescue dog. Mm -hmm. And I would never in a million years suggest somebody not do that. Um, of the five dogs that I currently own now, two I bought, three were rescue dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but if somebody is really going to the trouble of doing a good job and doing what they're supposed to do when they breed a dog, mm -hmm. then you can know an enormous amount. It's more from predictable. Them. Oh, Much hugely more, more predictable. Down predictable. Again, <laughs> yes, but again, you have to avoid sort of your, you know, uh, just let's make money. This is fun for me, and so people often don't know the difference. I've had people yeah. call me and say, "I'm going to get a dog from such and so," and here's their website, and I say, uh, "You didn't buy this dog yet." No, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> Not a good idea. Let me refer you elsewhere. Right. So, um, right. but even when you get a dog um, from a pound or from a rescue group, if you can meet the dog and they're not exhausted, you can tell a lot. Yeah. So if you have a little. So that would have been the wiser thing, having us be completely clueless about how You're to even a handle chance. a dog. It was. Yeah. It was and a and risk in the that situation mm -hmm. that he came from, we don't really know if, if where he was the person was somebody that I knew and we had dogs that we could reference. Oh, remember Merlin? Oh yeah, he was like this. Or you know Juanita, she acts like this. And we were on the same page because yeah. when people describe dogs, what they describe and what they're looking at, I'm looking at the same thing and same, I'm not saying that. Right. <laughs> okay. But if I know we speak the same language and they were describing him and he was in an environment where he wasn't just totally regimented from crate to kennel mm -hmm. and they told me he was a certain way, then I would consider, th I would respect that. Right. But other than that, if you can see a dog that's not tired and you can interact with it a little bit, you can tell a lot, even from that small interaction. Yeah. For instance, if you have a little puppy who comes running gangbusters at you and jumps all over your leg, well, that's very cute mm -hmm. for a little puppy. Yeah. But then when it grows up and it does the same thing, how cute is that? I remember somebody who, uh, purchased a puppy and she thought it was hilarious how this dog took the other litter mates, grabbed him by the neck and chucked him down the hill. And they were eight weeks old. It was funny. You yeah. know, I could see where that might be playing. entertaining. Right. <laughs> but when the dog got big and started doing it to her kids, uh, it wasn't so funny anymore. No. So, you know, there are a lot of things right. that actually, if you think about it, are fairly obvious. But again, people have this idea that dogs come as clean slates and we're just going to give right. them love and that will conquer all and we train them and everything's hunky-dory and it just isn't that way. Well, and even, I think even people that have, you know, very well, you know, from great breeders, very predictable, it's still, it's still work and you still need to train oh, them. Oh, sure. So when you're setting your, your training expectations. We talked a little bit about this with um, Kathy and Stella and what she was willing to live with 
given that Stella was so small. And, you know, my Merlin is uh, 62 pounds and still growing and very strong. And when he decides he doesn't want to do something, you have to be really firm with him. And we like to have control in our house. <laughs> so that's why I'm on such a long mission to get him well trained, because I don't want him. Or you could just let him be a nut and write a book and then make a million dollars like the author go. of Marley or, or and me. Or it could be Merlin you know. and me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, so I think we have a kind of high bar of how you we do. want him to behave and how we don't want to impose him on guests and, you know, we want him to behave Well, I think guests come in, in so your situation, you've got, <clears throat> number one, Merlin is a tough dog. He's yeah. tough because he has a high energy level. He's tough because you didn't have him as a puppy. I, I really think that if he was a very young puppy mm -hmm. and he received socialization early on, he wouldn't be so twitchy and paranoid and mm -hmm. tending to feel he had some bone to pick with dogs that he ran into on walks. Um, he is extremely stubborn. He's physically tough. Yeah. So he doesn't recognize when you're even trying to give him a correction. It's like, hello, he's yeah. not, you're not there. <laughs> um, and all of those things are big challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, he has a very nice disposition, though. Yeah. He's very loving. He's very tolerant of your kids. I don't think he really wants to hurt any other dogs. But mm -hmm. I think if he's acting up and he does that to the wrong dog, you could have big trouble. Right. And, it's, and it can cause a problem regardless. And it's certainly very unpleasant. So you have that, which is this dog that's pretty challenging. And then you've never had a dog before. Right. Which is like a double. That's yeah, like it's a double whammy. <laughs> it is, and that's why again. The armory bird is like vertical. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's again why I have to give you a lot of credit because you know, as I said, you'd worked with him before. A lot of people at that point would have said, "I invested X amount of time, X amount of money. It didn't work out." I mean, I've had people do this to me. I had one um, student call me and said, uh, "You know, I paid you money, and we had a lesson, one lesson." And I don't have time for my dog, and nobody else in my house has any time to train this dog, and my dog's not trained. Okay. <laughs> and she was really mad, and she yeah. was serious. Yeah. And so, you know, that night I took all my cleaning products and brought them back to the supermarket to complain that my house was still dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't work. So. Right. But so regardless... Training, it's an investment in time. All yeah, dogs require time it is. And, and, and if, if you love, I mean, they're all trained. No, absolutely not. And yeah. if you love dogs, then you're happy to spend the time. Yeah. That's how you want to spend your time. It gives you joy to spend mm -hmm. that time. But if you don't love dogs, then yeah. it's a burden. Right. Mm -hmm. Which brings up an issue or something to consider that, you know, I said at the beginning we were all on board with getting a dog. And my husband is not, and he, we've had this conversation, so this isn't, <laughs> I'm not airing dirty laundry. He did not grow up with a lot of pets. And he doesn't, he's, you know, he thought it would be cool to have a dog, but, you know, he could take it or leave it. And so, you know, he's kind of one of, he's like, I don't really, I don't have time to put in with the dog. So well, I, I'm you know definitely what? more of the I trainer, that and that can be an issue there in the family. Are some, I think people are kind of born with an innate that they love animals or they don't. Yeah. Because I, I, like, you know, I grew up in New York City, and I yeah. was wanted animals. And we'd mm -hmm. spend time in upstate New York with a family that lived with a lot of animals. And I, oh, summers were just great for me. My son, on the other hand, grew up with all my pets, and he used to come to work with me. And as a matter of fact, on my web page, I have a little gallery of pictures called My Mother is a Dog Trainer, mm -hmm. because I have pictures of him with every all kind of dogs. possible variety of dogs. And he, he likes the dogs, but he, I'd say he kind of perceives them to be sort of like annoying little brothers and sisters that, you know, oh. get his pants gobbed up with nose right. prints and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think that maybe your husband's just not a dog person. I think yeah, you, either no, you are or yeah. you're not. Right. And one of the things that I find frequently to be the case is that one person in the family is t the primary person to be responsible for the pet, mm -hmm. and that's okay. And the only downside with that is that if he doesn't participate at all, he can't expect Merlin to have the same relationship with him as Merlin will develop with you. Yeah. And if he wants Merlin to do something and he has no idea how to make it happen, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So if he's willing to accept that and not participate, as many people will and are willing to, right. then that's fine. But if he expects a different outcome, which is I'm not going to participate at all, and yet Merlin will do what I said just because you yeah. know, I gave him a roof over his head. Right. He doesn't know that. <laughs> Well, and that's something else that we've learned is that, and we just talked about this recently, the training doesn't translate from one person to the other necessarily. No, I mean, so I spend time, you know, Merlin knows many commands when I give them to him 
sometimes he'll do them for, the, for my girls and for my husband, and sometimes they won't, and some better than others. But just because he will come to me doesn't mean he'll come to my daughters or to my husband if they haven't worked with him. Right, and training isn't And fancy. any dog is like that. It's yes. not just my stubborn dog. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> every once in a while, I have worked with dogs who are extremely devoted to the person that they live with. And if I get them to listen to me, they will listen even better to them. Mm -hmm. That's really rare. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Most of the time, if I take a dog and I train it for somebody and it transfers 80% mm -hmm. and they work with the dog, I think that's good. Yeah. Okay? But honestly, why should a dog just automatically understand what you mean and give you respect mm -hmm. if you haven't earned it? Yeah. I think that's fair. I yeah. think dogs are pretty straightforward and honest. You haven't worked with me, you haven't spent time with me, and you expect me to have a good relationship with you. That's yeah. not going to happen. Right. So that's something to consider when you're getting a family pet is yeah. what, who, what people's commitments are going to be, what level of training you want, and then what behavior you're willing or not well, willing to accept. Well, I've been hired by people whose names we won't mention, <laughs> <laughs> who, who are very well known or very, have a lot of money or, yeah. you know, think that they can just buy this and buy that right. and they are hiring me to train their dog and the dog's just going to do it and I'm telling them, no, it doesn't work that way. And when I really say, no, it doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. they usually fire me, <laughs> which is fine with me right. I didn't like you anyway, but you know, people just don't get that. Yeah. You can't pay me money and I'm going to train your dog. Yeah. That's ridiculous. You know, right. you have to do it. Unless yeah. the dog pays for the lessons, then maybe the dog <laughs> The dog can train itself. That's Wouldn't right. that be great? If the dog can train for the lessons, then it might work. <laughs> so, um, it, what are, you teach puppy classes. You teach classes well, as well as private lessons. Yeah. So, what are the basics? I mean, are there certain basic things? Is it that? Well, when the, all the know, people that we were um, looking at earlier were mm -hmm. people that I was working with privately, mm -hmm. and some of those people then go on to do groups mm -hmm. um, and it used to be that I'd only do private lessons because honestly it is so much easier to work one-on-one because -on -one mm -hmm. I can really narrow down exactly what that dog needs and exactly what that person needs but a lot of people like groups and groups mm -hmm. have an advantage of they're more economical if you want to socialize your dog mm -hmm. that's a good place to do it if you want to get your dog to listen around distractions that's a wonderful place to do it and it helps reinforce mm -hmm. all this stuff um, and so I have two levels of classes, and I'm somewhat limited in how many types of classes I'm going to have because I teach at various community centers. So right now mm -hmm. I'm teaching at West Hartford, I'm teaching in Bloomfield, and I just started teaching in New Britain. Mm -hmm. So I did one series there. I don't know if I'll do more. We'll find out. <laughs> and that's on my website in case you want to know. Um, but my beginner group class, which is for puppies mm -hmm. and for older dogs, I have a curriculum. My level two class, we do more based on what dogs are in there and what things we want to advance and getting reliability. But the first class and the foundation of pretty much everything is leash manners. And leash manners basically means this. If I'm holding you on the leash and I don't want to go over there, we're not going over there. You're mm -hmm. staying with me and you're not going to pull me and you're not going to throw a fit. I've had dogs actually have major meltdown temper tantrums and I'm not doing anything. I'm just standing there and not going where they want me to go. Yeah. And I've had people get, oh, look, oh, my God, what's happening? You know, what is the, what's the dog doing? I go, he's throwing a tantrum. <laughs> and I'll just wait and he'll stop. And, you know, you know they, they stop just like a little two-year-old. So that's part of it. Uh -huh. And then the other is if I'm going, you need to come with me. Mm -hmm. If you watch people walking their dogs, it's the funniest thing because, like oh, yeah, it looks like they're water skiing and um, <laughs> the dog stops. <laughs> <laughs> looks like somebody dropped an anchor. Yeah. The dog's going to the right, they're going to the right. The dog's going to the left, they're yeah. going to the left. And, and really, the only purpose they're serving in controlling the dog is if there was an emergency, it tried, the dog tried to go on the road, then they'd yeah. stop the dog. But other than that, the dog speeds up to go see something. Oh, they're speeding up right behind mm -hmm. them. Well, you can't train a dog and have a dog follow you and understand mm -hmm. what you want them to do if you're busy doing what they're telling you to do. Right. And if you don't have good control on a leash, you're not going to have good control off the leash. Yeah. And so if you can't control your dog by simply holding the leash, having them follow you along, being mannerly, not pulling you, then everything else is going to yeah. be big trouble. You're so not going to even get to the doggy too close. That's right. So the, <laughs> <laughs> so the first class and half of my second class is leash manners. Mm -hmm. Then we do a variety of different commands, and uh, what I try to get people to understand, because people will often say to me, well, how do, what do I do to train my dog to come? Well, you know, there's 
levels of things that you do. You start out with one thing, then you build on it, then you build on it, then you build on it. So there, and there's different things that you do in each one of those steps. So it's almost impossible for me to answer that question yeah. in a couple of sentences. So I try to get people to understand how to break things down. So for instance, with a stay command, you've got stay from a distance, you've got stay with distractions, you've got stay mm -hmm. for a long amount of time. Right. And those are all different things. And those are all things you have to blend into the training program. So I try to get people to think a little creatively and how to put this into effect in their day-to-day -day life and how to break things down into steps that are manageable for them and their dog so that they can work towards the goals that they want. And so I have a, a curriculum mm -hmm. that I break things down and, um, you know, hopefully people can put it together and right. get something out of it. That's right. the goal anyway. <laughs> right. Um, does training ever end? I mean, I know I've, I have, I mean, and I've dragged everyone in my life along my journey with training Merlin because part of it is Merlin, um, very soon after we got him, showed aggression towards dogs. At least I read it as aggression mm -hmm. now. Well, it was aggression. I mean, he barking crazy, snarling, hackles up, just scary fits on the leash when we passed other dogs, which scared me because I didn't know what the heck to do about it. And it's been a long road trying to get over that. And he's gotten tons better. Still a problem, but tons better. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought of where I was going. Well, you oh, so <laughs> when does it ever end? So my, I feel like end? I... Just, it, yeah, never like, <laughs> it never ends. It just never ends. Well, the fact um, of the matter is it really doesn't ever end. Yeah. Um, but there's a point at which you are putting a lot more effort into it. Yeah. And then it kind of tapers off. But there's a certain amount of management Mm -hmm. You know, if if um, you can't I've, just stop. Well, let's put it this way: if I were to ever clean my house, spick and span, top to bottom, mm -hmm. when does that ever end? <laughs> yeah. And then if I did a really good job and never did it again, right? Okay. And depending, I mean, one of the things we'll make an analogy here, since we went down that road, with my house is I have too much stuff. Yeah. So it makes it harder for me to maintain right. a clean house. And I have a lot of pets. That makes right. it harder for me to maintain a clean house. So some dogs are harder to maintain because mm -hmm. of their disposition. And other homes that, you know, they're, they look like, you know, a showroom right. at a furniture store. <laughs> and there it's isn't a lot there. of stuff. And right. they have people that come in and help them. Right. Well, that's not that hard to maintain. Right. And so all dogs, if you don't ever do anything with them, will start to get rusty. And some dogs, their basic nature is such that what they want to do naturally is good enough. And in the instances where their nature is not good enough, some maintenance of training will need to take place, or over time it will deteriorate. I've had people call me with dogs that are you know, eight years old, and they did most of the training when the dog was less than two. And all of a sudden, the dog's jumping up and stealing stuff off the counters and not listening to commands. And basically what they tell me is their interaction with their dog consists of letting them out to go to the bathroom in the fenced-in yard, having them come in, and that's it. Yeah. There's so you have to maintain the relationship yeah. over time and yeah. build it into your daily routine. Exactly. And yeah. I usually tell people that, let's say, this is really great, this below this is really bad, unacceptable, mm -hmm. and anything in between here is kind of tolerable, mm -hmm. try to keep it here, and then when you start to see it start sinking down, mm -hmm. you're having to repeat yourself, your dog is starting to get a little twitchy mm -hmm. in certain situations, that's the time to fix it. Don't yeah, maintain don't training at the barely tolerable point, because then when the training gets testy or starts right. to deteriorate, you have no wiggle room. Right. So it'll get, it'll get easier, but there's always maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. So I, we're just about out of time, but okay. I think we've, mm -hmm. we've talked a lot about a lot of good stuff, and I think people are thinking, what kind of crazy dog does that woman have? <laughs> people who, know, who have seen us know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but we do love Marlon. I do want to say he's a sweet dog. He's so good with people. He loves people. He's, he's learning to love dogs. Maybe not love them, but tolerate them. Um, and we're going to keep going. We're, we're, we're on a good path. Um, and if you have any questions about your dog specifically, about training in general, that you have for Lori, you want more details, um, give her a call, go on her website, you can get more information. She does teach group classes in West Hartford. Um, and I hope, hopefully you've learned a little something um, through our two-part series. I'm Sarah Connor. You've been watching Life in Style with Sarah, and don't forget to tune in next month to a brand new episode. Thanks.